uh, Joanna, and thank you very much, Joanna, for coming today. Thank you so much for having me, and it's really an honor to be here, uh, especially to be able to share my story with all of you who clearly resonate uh, with veterans and the story that we have to tell. So we'll go to the first slide. Girl at Sea was first released in September of 2015. And my original idea was to do a compilation of sea stories. I canvassed our group of female academy grads, we have a little closed group, to see if anyone would be willing to share their stories. I thought for sure that people would want to share what they'd experienced in this groundbreaking time in our country's history. And what I found really surprised me. In fact, only one person responded. And I interviewed her and I could tell she was really holding back to the point that if you were to say, I'll call it a spice scale of one to 10, I think she shared maybe a two or a three because she was really afraid to show any vulnerability, any weakness. The day after her interview with me, she called me and she said, shred your notes. I am not ready for anyone to know my story. And unfortunately, I think that there's been a common thread through the officer community as well as just the military in general to not show any weakness, any sense of vulnerability. And I think as a country, we haven't done a good job of providing a soft place for our veterans to land. Has anyone seen the Facebook, uh, it was a couple years ago, the 22 push-up challenge, where people were doing 22 push-ups a day? It was in honor of our veterans because we've experienced 22 suicides a day from our veterans suffering from PTSD that didn't have the support that perhaps they needed. And that really struck a chord with me. After she decided to pull out and uh, I didn't get an overflowing of responses, uh, the original thing was to perhaps do a chicken soup for the soul compilation. One of my favorite things when I was studying at the academy as well as in the fleet when you're on the mid watch was hearing those sea stories because I think that we can all gather some precious nuggets from them and feel like you're not alone. It was then that I decided it was time for me to really write my own story. And with that, I was completely honest, perhaps more so than you'll see in, in many memoirs, especially military memoirs. And I think and believe wholeheartedly that there's beauty and strength in your vulnerability and it's not something to be ashamed of and to hide because we all have a story to tell. I didn't grow up thinking I was going to go to the academy. Several of my classmates got inspired by Magnum PI or other family members. My dad had been a Marine, but he served in the Vietnam era got out just before his unit was deployed to Vietnam. I think he always felt a little bit guilty that he didn't get a piece of the action, also grateful that he didn't have to face life and death in that manner. I was a swimmer, and I was recruited to swim by several schools around the country, uh, including West Point and uh, Stanford and Harvard and Illinois schools. I grew up in Illinois, and it's, really something that shaped me and was a huge part of my life. I had a great guidance counselor and he really uh, was a fan of the academies. And it was easy for me to believe where else in the world could I get one of the best educations possible, be trained to become a leader, and also have an exciting job after graduation, all built into this pressure cooker of an environment. <laughs> I had no idea really what I was in for. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, it's fiercely competitive. At the time that I was there, women uh, were 10%. There were 4,000 men, 400 women there. Um, we, I'm the class of 1994. Just to get in, there were 12,000 applicants for each 1,200 positions. You had to be qualified physically, medically, and academically, and have a congressional nomination. I ended up getting into both West Point and the Naval Academy and decided uh, on my birthday, which is Christmas um, the 24th, if anyone has ever heard how they deliver an Academy appointment, they show up at your door in this 
with this beautiful um, appointment letter that's in this packet. And it's not even a packet. It's, it's something you could frame. <laughs> and I ended up getting both appointments uh, on the same day. And they were, Merry Christmas, Happy Birthday, you got in. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, my recruiting visit to West Point was fantastic. I really like the coaches, but I like the opportunities in the Navy and the potential to either go Marine Corps or Navy. Plus, the fact that Annapolis was in a city uh, was a, a big plus, as opposed to on top of a big, dark, cold mountain. <laughs> West Point's a great school. I have immense respect for you guys, absolutely. <laughs> but am I right? It is kind of a big, dark, cold mountain. <laughs> But I still really didn't know what I was in for. Um, I, I didn't know all the classes of ships in the Navy or weapons bow to stern on a Spruance class destroyer or any of the other rates, let alone the ranks. And I got there and, and it was a crude awakening for me. Um, in fact, I was a very good athlete, which helped to earn instant respect because I could do as many push-ups and pull-ups and run as fast as these guys. However, the big thing was that the professional knowledge was a big challenge for me. I'd like to share a short reading uh, from my first day of the brigade return, and that's called Hell Night. And if you can see here, um, that first picture is induction day. And in that day, you get your uniforms. You've never worn them before. You're told how to stand at attention and do some very quick facing movements. Duct tape up the hems of your pants, um, especially mine, because I have kind of short legs and they weren't issued for me. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you're completely entered into a new life. And my parents wrote me and my mom sent me a care package every single week for four years straight that I was at the academy. That was kind of amazing. And I lived out of that care package. I ate my meals there um, because I didn't want to get in trouble at dinner, at least one opportunity less <laughs> to get in trouble with my upperclassmen. As you can tell, I was a little stressed. Uh, that was my parents seeing me um, after parents weekend. And uh, I think we lost probably 15 pounds that summer. And I was pretty stressed, I'll be honest. It was the first time I really had to work at my academics. And not only was I um, working on my academics, I was a Division I athlete and a swimmer for Navy. And then also there's the whole other professional side that didn't come intuitively at first for me. I had to work really hard. Finally, the beginning of academic year. Plebe summer is officially over when the brigade returns and the new class is introduced to all the upper class in their company and in the brigade. This happens just before the start of academic year. Meeting my company's upper class was a daunting task for me because during plebe summer, we only had four upperclassmen for every 34 plebes, and we all had gotten used to their leadership styles and knew their expectations. But once the brigade returned, we were completely out of our comfort zones again, as there would be three upper class to each one of us. To put it mildly, the return of the brigade scared the shit out of me. Leading up to Hell Night, we received a special invitation from the class of 1992. The class of 1992 in 29th Company took uh, the order to instill the fear of God in us really to a new level. The edges of my invitation were burned in an ominous manner. Per the note, we were required to bring a canteen and needed to be ready for virtually anything except a fun time. I hoped that I had studied enough for this first meeting and had no idea which second class would be in my squad or what they would be like. I only hoped that they didn't flame too hard and that no matter what, they wouldn't see me cry. As soon as the evening formation was over, the lights went out in our hallway, and the second class began kicking doors open and screaming. We knew that that was our formal call to the passageway. They were like a pack of hungry wolves ready to devour us, and I was scared. I didn't shake, but I couldn't wait for that night to be over. 
The entire class of, 90, of 1992 filed out in a scary pack and began firing questions at us and raids. Spratel, name the carriers in the Navy. Spratel, how the heck do you pronounce Spratel? Spratel, chain of command, top to bottom, go. Spratel, how many days until my ring dance? Spratel, and the questions went on and on. I was responsible for an impressive array of professional and practical knowledge that any one of them could ask at any time. I could hear all of my beloved classmates barking out their answers as loudly and confidently as they possibly could and knew that somehow we'd all make it through that night. More than perhaps any team I'd been a part of, I loved swimming for Navy. Um, prior to Navy, I grew up in the Illinois area. I just missed the Olympic trials in 1988. I trained with people who medaled in 88, 92, and 96. Uh, ended up at one point getting top three at nationals. Uh, my events were the 100 and 200 fly and the 100 back. And one of the nice benefits of being an athlete is that you get to see, sit at team tables sometimes. And team tables meant that you didn't have to eat with the upper class and sit on the first two inches of your chair and square all of your meals. <laughs> and also, um, the stress level went down. But if you didn't want to be thought of as a sandbagger or a slacker, you still showed up at least once a day to your company so that they knew that you cared. The other thing that was really nice, uh, swimming for Navy, and I'm sure for West Point, being a varsity athlete, you got to wear your letter sweater on Fridays, which meant you didn't have to wear a cover, which was really nice, which is your hat. And um, I'll remember, I'll never forget, my very first um, Army swim meet, and that was in the fall of 1990. And um, we had the superintendent and the bus pulled up and a band to see us off and the entire brigade to help us uh, gain that enthusiasm and courage to go out and beat Army. And I felt like a professional athlete when I got on that bus. Never before had swimming meant so much to me uh, and I felt so proud to be a part of a team and also growing to become someone to defend our country. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It definitely was walking a fine line. There were a lot of times that I felt like I was living an anomaly. How do you juggle and manage being true to yourself and being a woman coming of age with becoming a leader, becoming a professional, and also gaining people's respect? And you can see the stark difference between the two. In the center, I helped to train the class of 1996 and just found out actually this morning that one of my plebers there is now a district court judge, which makes my heart swell to have been a part of his formative years. Uh, and then also um, to be a part of such an amazing group of people. But it was definitely a struggle uh, to be able to maintain that professionalism and then also come of age and I think it's different when you're navigating those seas as a I don't want to say as a woman versus a man but with so few of us we were very very visible uh, if someone gained three pounds in their uniform the guys would comment on it for example and all sorts of things like that this one on the right uh, one of and I think I was a youngster at the time which is a sophomore um, one of the upperclassmen surprisingly asked to take my picture and I was not given civilian clothes yet at this point <laughs> and I was a little bit rady and went out on the seawall to capture that image but it was fun and worth it 18 years before women were officially allowed to serve on submarines the class of 1994 were the first women to do that in a pro trimid challenge and that was just before service selection to get a good idea of what you might want to do in the Navy. So you'd spend a couple weeks training with the Marine Corps, air, submarines, surface, to really get a good feeling about the, about the opportunities ahead and how you might serve and in what capacity. A lot of us at the time weren't sure about what we wanted to do. 
and combat wasn't even an option for 90% of my time at the academy. It was uh, in November, let's see, let's go to the next slide. And as I mentioned before, my parents were by my side every single step of the way, whether it was at the academy, through the care packages, or meeting me and my ship in Chile, um, and sending care packages even to the ship. <laughs> my mom was amazing. I miss her dearly. And my dad is um, just a fabulous guy. So in November of 1993, combat exclusion was lifted. And the class of 94 selected in January of 1994. And the thing that is kind of interesting about that is we had to quickly adjust course. And if we were physically qualified, we had to select a warfare specialty. I almost went Marine Corps. Um, one of the more unique things that I did uh, first class year that summer before, I studied in Mexico, but then I also did six weeks of training with the Marine Corps. And I really thought I wanted to eventually become a public affairs officer, since I'd been an English major, Spanish minor. Of course, I'd come out with a Bachelor of Science degree, but that was kind of more my background. And I thought that that's what I wanted to do. And when I came back to my first class year, I thought, how can I differentiate myself? And at first, um, one of my classmates had set up the Naval Academy Public Affairs team. And I was like, that's great for her. But what about me? I don't want to be one of her writers. <laughs> so I decided that the Pentagon was really close. And I called Headquarters Marine Corps Public Affairs and set up an internship for myself and went one day a week into the Capitol and the Pentagon and worked for Headquarters Marine Corps Public Affairs. And it was on that day, or during one of those training sessions at um, the Pentagon that I ran into one of my first mentors. And he was now an admiral, and he was at the National Military Command Center and spent a day with me showing me all the possibility in the Navy. And about a month before service selection, that question mark had really deeply been planted. Do I want to be a Marine, or do I want to be a surface warfare officer? And as you know, I decided to become a surface warfare officer. May 25th was my graduation day. That's President Clinton's head in the back of, of uh, my graduation picture. And tossing that cover in the air was a feeling I will never forget that you look forward to for four years and that stays in your memory the rest of your life. My first ship was the Paul F. Foster. She was a Spruance class destroyer, and she was home ported in Long Beach, California, and we were the last ship to go through the yards. When I got to her, as you can see, she's out of the water, going through a complete overhaul and dry dock. It's very hard to get your qualification as a SWO if you're not in the water. <laughs> Um, and in a dry dock, they take her apart completely, even the engines are pulled out, and then put her back together piece by piece, so she's completely seaworthy and ready to uh, do whatever our country needs. But it was very challenging. My first division was the repair division, and I thought, well, geez, I was an English major, maybe they'll put me in communications or navigation or something topside. And instead, I spent my entire time in surface Navy in every division in engineering at one time or another. I worked very hard to learn all of the systems um, and to really know that plant inside and out as well as the ship. It didn't come easy for me. In fact, I believe I created a SWO manual for myself that was this big, <laughs> literally, to study and learn because at the time, um, the phrase was SWOs eat their young. Has, has anyone ever heard that before? <laughs> it wasn't, it's an exciting, fun job where you get to travel around the world, get an immense amount of leadership at an early and young age, and what we're doing is exciting, but I quickly realized that the leadership really sets the tone and the pulse of the organization, where if we're not helping each other, lifting each other up, 
it can be incredibly stressful and it can be really, really hard. And unfortunately, my time on the foster was challenging. However, I'm really proud of the work that I did there and the division that I had. Um, the repair division guys, they were the, the guys that were the firefighters, would plug the holes in the event um, of a collision like we saw last year. They're the guys that would fix the, machini the machinist mates and the plumbers. So they were the salt of the earth, really good guys that would save your life in the event of a catastrophe. Last year we had two collisions at sea, the McCain and the Fitzgerald, and they hit me really hard because I could imagine what those people went through. I could imagine the birthing compartment filling with water at 2.30 in the morning, the officer of the deck on the bridge that didn't call the captain, and all of the repair D seamen frantically trying to save people's lives. We we're lucky only 15 people died. And it's amazing, I just got goosebumps <laughs> as I think about, you know, what they went through and the training I had and how it's still a part of me now, even though I'm so far removed from that time in my life. We were the first women on board the Paula Foster. When we got there, um, let's see, I was the fourth woman on board and these uh, five ladies and I, we were the first women um, until we integrated and at first, um, on that ship, they had heads for us. When we go to my second ship, you'll see I didn't even have my own bathroom for three months, <laughs> which was somewhat interesting. Let's go on. My parents flew out to Virginia Beach uh, about a month before I deployed um, to Unitas around South America. And they were there when I pinned on lieutenant. And then I think uh, the other picture is the captain and, and also when I, I got my pin. When I got to the Lamore County, she's a tank landing ship in Little Creek, Virginia. I was the first and only woman on board. In fact, um, we integrated about two to three months later. I didn't have a bathroom, so they had a little flip sign. And I'd flip it back and forth when I was in there. And uh, one morning, I thought the coast was clear and I was safe. and. I get in there and the supply officers got the newspaper and I see some size 12 boots in the stall next to me. He's like, hey Joanna, how's it going? And I'm like, good. <laughs> uh, but what I really learned is it's important to let things roll off your back. Even things that, you know, sometimes are a little tough. Again, I was in the engineering department. At this point, I guess I'd become pretty darn good at it because uh, on the Lamar County, I was the MPA and the auxiliaries officer, and then I also took over the electrical division too. And this was the senior, um, senior chief of the whole engineering department. We had a, a really good relationship. These were some of the, my guys in the hole, actually, if you see um, the picture on the right. And my senior chief and I, um, the relationship a lot of times with um, senior enlisted uh, personnel and officers, their second job, their unwritten job, is to train the junior officers as well. Help to make them strong leaders, kind of pull them aside and say, what the heck are you doing over here? Or guide them back um, because they're a little more salty. They've got, you know, 20 years in the Navy or more, sometimes less, but also, the junior officers at this point, I'd been an officer for five years, and um, it's an interesting balance of power. It wasn't all smooth sailing for me, though. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, a woman is like a tea bag. You never know how strong she is until she's put in hot water. And with that, I'm going to share a little sea story with you guys. It is, isn't it? <laughs> you guys saw that picture of, of my senior chief, right? I'm going to quickly set the stage. So I was uh, aboard the Lamar County and I'd been doing pretty well. My very last big qualification was engineering officer of the watch. And the engineering officer of the watch um, 
job is to fight the ship uh, in the event of any engineering casualty or a collision or um, how to be able to handle this multi-million dollar piece of machinery um, at any given time and run, um, run the plant and all the people in it to make sure that we save the ship. And so part of that qualification, similar to a SWO board, was that first you would do an oral board. So you'd sit in a room and in my case, six men would fire any question away at me, um, typically engineering related, because this wasn't a SWO board that they possibly could think of. And how fast can you think on your feet? And you know that part, I knew my stuff at this point. I'd worked really hard and I was actually a good engineer and a good surface warfare officer and I was ready for that. But the last piece of the puzzle was what's called an engineering casually control drill. It's where you plan for anything that could possibly go wrong and you practice so that when you practice something like that, God forbid we have to face it, it's not the first time you're going through these steps in your head. You're at that heightened level of awareness and reaction time um, to think quickly on your feet. Now prior to this point, when we were doing these drills, we would maybe do four drills in a half an hour or in 45 minutes just to kind of train at an easy pace. And that was my expectation when I walked in that morning. After having completed several, several slower paced drills, I felt that I was finally ready for this last step in earning my EL letter. I was a little nervous as I made my way down into the casualty control center and saw my senior chief. But the moment I saw my senior chief, I noticed a sly look on his face. What came out of his mouth was even more astounding. I looked up at him and said, good morning, senior. He looked down at me and said as strongly as he possibly could, you're going down, ma'am. No effing broad is going to be EO on my ship. And he said it like that. <laughs> I, uh, I thought that surely I must have imagined that snide comment and looked back up at him. But what I saw was a hardened face and decided that it was time I dig in and show them all what I was made of. Game on. I stubbornly retaliated, dug my heels in, sucked in a deep breath, and looked up at him and spat back, screw you, senior. I know my shit. Bring it. I think that everyone in CSS or CCS was completely stunned at what had just happened. I was the senior woman on board and highly respected. It was unheard of for a senior chief to speak to someone like that at such a crucial moment. I didn't have time to really digest it all because within seconds, all hell broke loose in the drill set. The chief engineer, senior chief, and captain all had headsets on and began running the drill sets in a cascading fashion. Where, in the past, we'd run four or five in 45 minutes, they proceeded to throw 12 casualties at me in 30 minutes. We had never run a drill set like this before. At first, they called a lube oil leak in engine room one, followed by a fire in engine room number three, and flooding somewhere else. This is a very high stress environment and would be easy for anyone to crack under the pressure. It never occurred to me that I couldn't do it. Failure just wasn't an option. I dug in and stubbornly barked out my commands per the EOCC as fast and as strong as I possibly could. It was hard to keep everything straight in my mind since there were multiple issues in each engine room, but somehow I managed to maintain my focus. While my evaluators were deliberating over my performance and if my performance was good enough to warrant an EL letter, at the end of the drill set, as it began to wind down, my senior engine room Ian, engine man, Ian One ran out of the main engine room and gave me a hearty high five. He had sweat dri dripping down his cheek and a big smile across his face. As he enthusiastically slapped my back and said, that was freaking awesome, ma'am. That was the best drill set I've ever seen. Regardless of the outcome, his praise meant the world to me. I'd finally completely earned the respect of all of my guys and we had worked well as a team during the most challenging drill set we'd ever seen. Although there was room for improvement, we did pretty darn well considering, and I have knots in my stomach even remembering it now.
Right after that, we left on a cruise around South America. The really exciting and special experience for me was that we did operations with every Navy along the way. We went through, um, we stopped in Puerto Rico, we picked up our Marines. So we had embarked uh, about 500 Marines. We also had a SEAL team embarked and uh, then our crew on board. And the tank, uh, the Lamar County was a tank landing ship. So what that means is she'd come in pretty close to shore, drop her bow ramp, and then the Marines would drive their tanks off the bow ramp and do a beach assault. And that was the idea behind the tank landing ship. Now, the Lamar County at this point uh, was contracted to be sold to Chile. And they had already sold the Valdivia, and the Lamar County was the last remaining tank landing ship in the U.S. fleet. And she was doing this Unitas and one more the year later. And with the Unitas, uh, it was pretty special. Um, not only did we help to train the South American navies, but we also would bring supplies and humanitarian supplies to the orphanages and countries that we w as we would arrive. Uh, you can see in the middle picture, I've got um, a group from an orphanage there. And I gave them a tour of the ship. And uh, also on the bridge, there I am uh, with the captain and the pilots. I speak Spanish, and I started to lose a lot of it when I started that cruise. I got my minor in Spanish. Um, but then it became really evident early on that as we would come into these ports, we would embark pilots. And the captain had a choice between a native speaker that maybe didn't know surface warfare and navigation and shipping as I do, or me who could kind of find my way around saying whatever I needed to. And I became the translator between the captain and all the pilots that we embarked. And it was really special because when we would pull into port, a lot of times the pilots would bring me home to meet their families and I got to really get a good taste of their country and culture, which was pretty special. We went down the Atlantic through the Straits of Magellan and then up the Pacific um, and the Golfo de Pena uh, where we popped out um, of the Straits of Magellan. Now that water is, is pretty rough. I'm not going to lie. In fact, um, about, well now I would say about 50 years ago, ships that weren't strong enough, their, if a wave would overtake them, their engines could drive them to the bottom of the ocean. Um, everything that's not hatched down there becomes a missile hazard, no joke. And the Chilean pilots uh, came on board for the entire transit, which was great. The last reading I wanted to share is um, about my time uh, on board the Valdivia. And that ship, I was actually the first woman on board um, ever, and they allowed me to light off their plant in Spanish, which was really unique. And the captain also um, had me help him with some of the messages and, and everything else. And it was different because the Chilean Navy's officers typically specialized in one thing. Like if you were a navigator, that was your specialty and that was it. Or if you were the chief engineer, you just did the engineering. And the way the US trains our officers is to know the entire ship so that you can take command eventually and have a good idea about how the entire um, operation works together. And I really saw how valuable that was when I was on the Valdivia and able to light off the plant in Spanish and then go up on the bridge and help with navigation and some of the message traffic. So it was, it made me really proud of um, how far I'd come as a surface warfare officer and to be part of our US Navy. Chile. We pulled into Punta Arenas, Chile, in order to refuel and pick up our three Chilean pilots. Punta Arenas is a small fishing village at the very tip of the Straits of Magellan. Unfortunately, I didn't get any liberty in this port, and I froze myself, or froze my buns off, on the small boat duty, ferrying people back and forth. The transit through the Straits was perhaps one of the most picturesque that I have ever seen in my lifetime, as well as one of the most navigationally demanding. We embarked three Chilean pilots, Christian Soro, Victor Zanelli, and Rojas. I found Zanelli to be funny with his curly-haired antics, but got along best with Christian Soro. 
They were a breath of fresh air for our wardroom and lightened the mood considerably. The 350 mile transit through the Straits took us roughly four days. At its narrowest point, the Strait is a little over a mile wide, requiring very precise shipping and navigation. In the beginning, we traversed harsh, snowy, ice-cold weather and ventured where only the bravest of adventurous souls go to begin their journeys, kayaking and mountaineering her massive snow-laden peaks. The beauty of the land took my breath away. As I stood to watch on the bridge gaping at her untouched coast and watched as the penguins played and slid across the ice. I felt closer to Mother, Mother Nature or God than I'd ever had before. There were no towns, with the exception of a couple of very small fishing villages right along the strait. The pilots were extremely professional, yet still able to joke around and have fun on the bridge, which was completely different from the perennial stick that seemed to be up most of our officers' butts. It was very refreshing for me and made me smile inside every time I got the opportunity to stand a watch with them. Perhaps the most interesting part of the transit was the Golfo de Pena, where we had to enter the Pacific very briefly before re-entering the Straits in order to finish the transit. The part of the Strait got its name from the fact that the turn of, at the turn of the century, two out of every 10 ships managed to complete the transit. Literally, ships were swallowed by the vicious sea as her large waves would overtake the hull and their respective engines would drive them to the bottom of the ocean. It was scary for us too, even on a 560 foot long US Navy vessel. Prior to entering this gulf, we were all told to completely stow and tie down everything within our staterooms and were warned that if it weren't tied down, it would become a missile hazard. I thought I'd been in rough seas before and that I could handle this. But the truth of the matter was that I had never seen rolls like this before. The Lamore County took 45 degree rolls. And we all watched in horror as she almost came unhinged. We barely limped out of the Gulf that evening. I tried to get some rest in my stateroom before my rev watch, which began at 0200, two o'clock in the morning. But the ship rolled so much that I just squeezed my eyes shut and hoped not to fall out of my rack and fly across the room. I talked to my roommate throughout the night and we both took turns reassuring each other. We listened as the hull creaked around us and everything within our drawers banged. We had a Clash Charlie fire, almost lost our starboard anchor, and had one of our bosun's mates uh, actually harnessed up to salvage the anchor. We lost a shaft and limped out of there on just one shaft at 12 knots. We made it and we survived, but it definitely was an example of the respect you need to have for what you're doing. Even a US Navy warship could get swallowed by the sea. Later on after uh, the Navy, I ended up getting my MBA while I was finishing my time at Great Lakes. I was really fortunate uh, to be able to run the graduation ceremonies. At first, uh, when I ran those graduation ceremonies, the first time I walked out there, I could hear my heart beating in my ears, literally. And at the time, people used these big Motorola headsets, and my staff, we would put on um, every graduation ceremony every week to 500 to 700 people at Great Lakes. And in the beginning, you know, they were like, oh, how's the tenants Bertel gonna do, you know? <laughs> and I remember marching out there and getting the job done. And then after a while, even the extraordinary becomes kind of ordinary if you do it regularly. And then I, I got kind of smooth. And I all, all actually had the first paragraph kind of memorized. And I thought, I've got this. And it was the summer surge, so there was a much larger crowd. About 750 people in the audience this hot summer Chicago late afternoon. And when I walked out there, I didn't have quite enough air in my lungs that day. In fact, this is what came out. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Rear Admiral Edward E. Hunter. <laughs> 
So if you uh, were to equate this to, I think I just turned red doing that. <laughs> equate this to someone um, dribbling a ball and that ball starts to get away from you. What do you do? Do you watch it bounce away? Or do you have that training, confidence, and knowledge to quickly snap that back up, let it roll, and keep on going? My staff wasn't sure if I was going to be able to continue from that brief lapse in breath. <laughs> I looked out at the crowd, and I could hear even a slow rumble across the crowd. And I was able to snatch that ball back up due to my training and finish that speech um, but luckily also kind of brought me back down to earth to know that even if you've done it a hundred times, you've still got to have respect for what you're doing. My whole purpose and thought process behind writing Girl at Sea was to help people realize that they're not alone. And sharing some of my more personal stories, that was my hope. To believe in yourself, trust your training, and to know that, ooh, that didn't look good. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're stronger than you think and capable of much more than you realize. I think it's because the font's a little different. Um, I should have saved it as PDF. Sorry about that, guys. And one of the things I really believe that I've carried with me through the rest of everything I've done is that when the seas get rough, we can always just adjust course. Sometimes it's that small five degree course change that makes a big difference in our lives or in our people's lives. So after the Navy, I ended up um, working for Procter & Gamble for a while and even um, being CEO and part owner of a casino in Cripple Creek and we had about 150 employees. And I'll never forget one day, I think it was two dealers because we had machines and blackjack tables and a restaurant and a bar and it was a pretty big operation. They were walking through the casino and they didn't know I was behind them. They said, well, we just adjust course here. <laughs> and I was like, they heard me. <laughs> and as my friends at No Barriers USA like to say, what's within you is stronger than what's in your way. And that's what I truly believe. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Also, um, I wanted to extend an offer to you all. Uh, one of the things that I do now, I run an e-commerce company. And I specialize in massage chairs and zero gravity recliners and near-infrared saunas. Um, I would love to extend a 10% discount to you all just with the coupon code VET10. And um, I have cards up here, too. If I can help at all in anything, um, I would be honored to help you, whether it's a speaking engagement or talking to someone interested in the academy or anything at all, please let me know. Thank you so much for having me today. Why did they send you around the horn instead of uh, through the canal? In, um, uh, why did they send you through the Straits of Magellan? No, we went through the canal on the way back. Okay, but on the way out, where you went through the Straits? went down the Atlantic, right. through the Horn, or through the um, Straits of Magellan. I'm not sure their reasoning behind it. Um, it's a beautiful transit, but it's also <laughs> very treacherous. Yeah. I'm not sure if they still do that. Um, one of the other things I didn't mention to you guys, too, a year after I left the Lamora County, uh, she had been doing Unitas and ran hard aground. So hard aground that she had to be um, evacuated and it took them a year to move her and they dragged her out to sea and she became target practice, which broke my heart since she had been my home. And um, needless to say, she wasn't eventually sold to Chile. <laughs> You refer to the recent collisions at sea, and I guess a thought of us old guys is why. Uh, Seventh Fleet lost its job, and so many people below Seventh Fleet were fired. Uh, we just don't understand how you could be. During Vietnam, we had some bad mishaps, but they were close in maneuvers, like alongside a carrier or whatever. But when you're out at sea and there's a merchant ship coming at you, why would they collide? That's the million dollar question. <laughs> 
Um, I have the same question because I know my training. And the captain sleeps, literally the bulkhead on the bridge is the captain's stateroom bulkhead. He was sleeping there. And I think about that and it was so unnecessary. Um, the captain had, had command for about two weeks before this collision actually happened. And he was fired immediately as well. Um, and really, when you think about it, why didn't that officer of the deck call the captain? You see a Christmas tree, is what we call it, coming at you, which means you've got the um, overhead white light, the port and starboard running light, and they're coming right at you, getting closer and closer and closer. And you can see it 30 minutes before, let alone five minutes before. And with those gas turbine engines and the ability to twist on a dime and go all engines back flank, I honestly believe there's no reason that this should have happened. Uh, I have, in my time at sea, heard some people say, this is US Navy warship on course 020. We're not moving, essentially. Get out of our way. Now, when you're in international waters, when English isn't the first language, and when the other ship's much bigger than us, we need to back away sometimes. And I hope that, I don't know who the officer of the deck was that evening, um, but I can only imagine the thought process. And you think you've got and hope you've been trained well enough to be able to re react in that high pressure situation and not be afraid. I don't know why he didn't call the captain. At the very least, the captain should have been on that bridge even in his underwear at two in the morning. No one would care if he'd been able to take the ship to general quarters and save those people's lives and avoid such a mishap. And to me, even, it's astounding. And I was really torn up last year thinking about it and wondering how in the heck could this happen and what has happened to our Navy. Thanks, Joanna. Just to add to the comment here, uh, one of our speakers, I think uh, last month, uh, Captain Retired Lynn Alby, gave a very good uh, s analysis of both of those collisions and what caused it. And it was a whole series of factors, but some of it's training, some of it's exhaustion and inexperience of the deck officers. Uh, and as you point out, all of us as young officers, the last thing you want to do <laughs> is have to call your senior officer to bail you out of a situation you think you should be able to handle. But it was a tragedy for, for you know, certainly for everyone in that. Uh, just one question for you. With your experience, and you certainly have grown as an individual, uh, would you recommend a military career for young women coming up now out of high school or, you know, with the challenges you faced? My daughter's here, but I don't know where she is. <laughs> oh, she's hiding behind the wall. <laughs> um, I think that things have changed measurably since I was at the academy and in the fleet. Now there's 30% women at the academy, 30% women um, approaching 35% out at sea. I think that it's a hard place to be, but then I think it shapes you in ways that nothing else possibly can. I believe that a big part of who I am is due to my time at the academy and in the fleet. Um, I do have two girls. They're 12 and 14. My ex-husband would say, <laughs> no way. Um, but I would say, I support you every single step of the way. And I think that the skills you learn and the DNA you share, and I believe I share DNA with all of you, is something you can't get anywhere else. And especially where our country is right now. Um, one, you still have to respect the position of commander in chief. We're all Americans first and foremost. It is our ship, our country, our forces. And when I hear people almost say they're not American, it breaks me up because that's what we have all fought for and what we believe in in our heart. Let's cross the aisles and be Americans first. And I, I would, support my daughters, and that's at a very personal level even. Um, but I'll be honest and say it's not going to be easy. 
The way has been paved by many before you, but it's still a tough road. <laughs> Any other questions? I have books available if anyone's interested in them. Uh, I'm happy to um, speak to any other groups that might be interested or companies, corporations, um, even leadership groups. And however I can help, as I said before, I would be honored to. No. We often are asked to talk at schools, and, uh, and I think it'd be marvelous to get Joanna for the young women who are, you know, graduating. Uh, just talking about challenges, I was teaching at West Point when the first women came in, and we actually mentored two of the young women. Uh, and I'll tell you, they had a challenge, because the old grads, and many of us, just no way felt women had a role in any of our service academies, you know, but they did exceedingly well. And I was recently back for my 50th year reunion at West Point, and for the great big parade, uh, three out of the four regimental commanders were women, and the brigade commander for the parade was a woman. Uh, so, I mean, they've done exceedingly well. Even when I was there, and I was the 14th class of women to graduate, um, they used to say, oh, you're just here for your MRS degree. Well, who's going to put themselves through that for an MRS? <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> and then, you know, they, they had these phrases, too, um, that now I'm very happy to say they don't even know what they mean. And one of the uniforms at the academy was winter working blue uniform alpha, WUBA. And um, then it became women with unusually big, or women used by, or women underestimated by all. And then my class kind of was like, we're going to wear this as a badge of honor. We're proud to be wooers. <laughs> and now they don't even know what that term means, which means we've at least taken several steps forward and really um, changed the mindset. Um, and I think that there's been a lot of growth on both sides as well. Were there any enlisted women on, your, on the ships that you were on? Absolutely. Were. Yes. Yeah. In fact, um, on the Lamore County, I was really fortunate because, um, as I told you in the beginning, I was the first woman, and then we started to embark all the enlisted crew, and then we had um, about 10% women, so maybe 30 on board. And then slowly it became more and more as the fleet uh, grew as well. Okay, so um, that's a really great question, and I think that in some ways, now maybe I'm obviously speaking from my perspective, but as an officer, you're viewed a lot more, like you're more visible, which means that every move you make, every piece of liberty clothing you wear will be completely scrutinized, and then that does kind of go downhill as well. Um, I worked really hard to be a good example for the enlisted women on board, um, but you've got a city at sea, essentially. You've got a bunch of kids that are between 18 and 25 years old with raging hormones just coming of age. So the most politically correct way to say that is, of course, things happened that perhaps you'd like to think that professionalism would not allow. However, at the very core, we're all human. So the challenges, they're not just 
for enlisted women or officers. They're for all of us, especially as you're navigating those, you know, rough social situations and learning what you like and don't like and becoming an adult woman or man. Um, so I think for all women on board, some of us are shorter, our voices are higher, and we're a lot more visible. And I think that for me, that was a challenge. What I didn't tell you guys is I went through the academy without spending any time on a U real US Navy warship. So I got to my first ship and my first order came out like a soft question mark. They had to say orders to the helm. And you wouldn't ever imagine that from me now, right? <laughs> I very quickly was able to find my voice. But one of the things I think that the military really is fabulous at is helping young people find their voice and confidence. And you get the training and background to be able to, to do that and come into your own. Anything else? So one more thing, Joanna. This is a challenge coin from the museum. Uh, thank you f very much for your for your talk. Thank you. And and uh, uh, again, you guys uh, take your time and ask Joanna more questions uh, if you want. And uh, again, Joanna has some books for sale. And uh, just stick around and uh, take got your time and look at the new stuff that we have here at the museum, especially downstairs. My dad actually made it. He's in the back of the. Oh, all right. <laughs> thank you for coming. All right.